Owens. Yo, Eric. Eric. Hey. Hey. Hello. Hey. Sweet. All right. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Um, why not? Right? Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're tuning in live to the San Francisco Dharma Collective for a Dharma talk on the idea of pranidhana in Buddhism, most often translated as devotion. And so this is gonna be the ninth of 10 paramitas, perfections or excellences, these 10 practices of the Bodhisattva that are outlined in our Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. This is what we've been working on for a, a number of weeks now. Uh, we're months, we're going on months now. And so, you know, I don't need to really, if you're, if you're tuning into now part 11, you probably know where what's going on, that we're discussing these 10 paramitas. And in particular, we're discussing 10 dharmas, 10 things, 10 practices, 10 observations, 10 dharmas in the practice of each of these 10 paramitas. And so you guessed it, we've been going through a hundred different dharmas. And so here we are on paramita number nine. So tonight we're gonna to have this great uh, conversation, great talk about pranidhana what is usually translated as devotion, and I've sort of stuck with tradition, although I'm gonna very, very quickly complicate this idea. It, you know, it's, it's about religion, religion's complicated, these words, ideas of faith, devotion, commitment, you know, they all get very complicated. So we're gonna talk about all of this, but in Sanskrit, it's this idea of pranidhana, and what, of course, what doesn't help this at all is, is that the, the standard English translation of the sutra that we're currently reading, they choose to translate pranidhana, the ninth paramita, as volition. And of course, that's not helpful at all <laughs> because it is very common to translate the Buddhist idea, it's not Buddhist idea, but it's, a, it's an idea in Buddhism, to translate the idea of samskara conditioning as volition, which isn't the, it, it's, that's not even a correct translation of, of samskara, but it has become commonplace to refer to samskara as volition or volitional thought patterns or volitional habits. So it doesn't do us any good <laughs> when, when this text decides to translate it as volition. So we're going to begin tonight by really clearing the air around this paramita, this particular paramita of pranidhana. You know, if you go all the way back to the beginning of this list, it's like dana generosity or giving. Even here at the SFDC, we talk about dana, we talk about giving, we talk about generosity. And so that paramita, the paramita of dana, the gift, dana is a gift. So the idea of dana, we get that. We're, we're very, we're comfortable with that. Shilla, moral discipline, this is classic Buddhism, watching your bodily karma, your vocal karma, your mental karma, that's all part of what it means to be a Buddhist, is to be sort of disciplined, but in a mindful way of the body, the speech, and the brain, or the mind. So that's, you know, that's pretty regular. Patience, it gets complicated, but the idea of patience is sort of 
you know, it, it, it fits, it fits very nicely with Buddhism, right? This idea, when, no matter how we think of kashanti or patience, it, 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 it feels right. We know what we're talking about. Drive or determination, virya, that's really kind of maybe where it starts to get interesting with the bodhisattva path. We spent a whole night, of course, talking about virya, this idea of determination, uh, uh, vigor, drive, energy. And, you know, we talked about the, the complexities of how do you practice that? <laughs> <laughs> but how do you practice that? And so we talked about ideas of like, well, when, when you feel that drive or determination, you act upon it versus not acting upon it, that is practicing drive or determination. Then we're in the paramita of meditation or dhyana. Now we are squarely within our comfortable world of Buddhism and what it means to be a Buddhist and what it means to be doing Buddhism meditation, dhyana, mindful awareness. So we're comfortable with the paramita of dhyana, pranya here in the Dharma doors, we spend night after night after night after night kind of trying to get at this idea of transcendent wisdom or pranya. So again, that's, that's very, very kind of uh, very comfortable for us within the, the discourse on the paramitas. Those, of course, what I just kind of quickly outlined are the six paramitas that you may be accustomed to hearing about. They're kind of the standard paramitas. And then we move into these last, sorry, these last four paramitas, were, which are very kind of special, unique paramitas. I took a whole night just talking about the specialness of upaya, this uh, skillfulness, skillful means. That one is even trickier in terms of how you practice it. Um, but uh, I, you know, did two whole nights on upaya. So then last, last Sunday, we got to talking about power, bala. And this, of course, as I mentioned, was referring to the supernormal powers, the siddhis or abhinya, super knowledges. And that's, of course, a unique... Um, well, the idea of superpowers or super knowledges are not unique to Buddhism, but I want to pause for a moment on how power was described. So this is just going to be kind of a quick, not even review, because I'm not even going to really get into the things that we talked about last week, but I just want to sort of like start tonight by referring to last week, the paramita of bala or power. And traditionally, you know, these were ideas of like passing through solid objects, levitation, uh, you know, uh, 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 time travel, all kinds of wild, beautiful superpowers. And I think something that I haven't quite mentioned yet. And, and in many ways, as I be, have been teaching this uh, for several weeks now, it's just kind of dawning on me. I want to mention a very kind of unique way that this whole sutra is, is happening, or, or not how it's happening, but there's, there's kind of a subtle, almost like a subtle humor. Buddha, you know, Buddhism's very funny. It's much funnier than I think it gets credit for that it's it's like of the world religions, I would argue it's the one that has a deep sense of humor. And so a lot of times, just like that really funny, sarcastic friend that you don't always know if they're being serious or not, they're so kind of funny. Buddhism's kind of like that. So you don't always want to laugh because you don't know, like, when is it, are they being funny or are they being serious? So to kind of share, and it, you know, it's not necessarily an, an LOL, like laugh out loud kind of humor, 
But what I mean is that, like, for example, if we go back to the very, very first uh, paramita, the paramita of giving, and, and the Buddha is going to tell Bodhisattva Akshayamati these 10 practices or observations, dharmas, that are, are of the utmost, foremost importance in the Bodhisattva's practice of giving. And then, you know, the idea is you're like, oh, okay. So like, should I give to charity? Should I give this? Should I give that? Like, how, you know, what's the best way to give? And then part of the, the list of 10 were things like great compassion, great kindness. And you're kind of like, wait a minute. I thought I was going to be like, you know, giving. And then you realize, oh, yeah, what a, you know, it's like what Buddhist is into giving, you know, like stuff. It's like stuff's kind of like a trap. And so the idea is like this, this sutra, and in particular, the way that these 10 dharmas for each of these 10 paramitas, the way the things that are being listed, they're supposed to kind of be like, not exactly what you thought the Buddha was going to say. That's what kind of makes it funny. And so, for example, last week, when we talked about power, the Bodhisattva is like, oh, yeah, what are the 10 powers? Is it levitation? Is it, you know, what is it? And we come to find out from this sutra that these 10 are these 10 deeply empathetic ways of understanding another sentient being's situation. Understanding the, the forest, the, the, the beautiful poetry last week was the forest of conditioning of mental afflictions or the forest of conditionings of mental habits or the forest of conditionings and kind of these 10 ways that the Bodhisattva can deeply empathize with other beings. And the idea is, of course, is that if you were, if you were getting ready for levitation and passing through solid objects, you, you might be like, well, but that doesn't sound very fun or magical or powerful. And that's what I mean by this sutra is that it's like the thing, these paramitas and what they imply, you would think that the 10 things coming, you would think that they would be one thing. And the fact that they're this other thing is like, um, you know, it's food for thought. It's, it's deep. It's, it makes the contemplation even deeper in that way and like deeper regarding the particular paramita and then even deeper regarding the practice, the, the Bodhisattva practice or just the practice of Buddhism. So I just wanted to share with you that idea that these 10 things that are being listed, they're kind of funny in that way. And and, and this kind of affords me a, an opportunity to say one other thing about the way this sutra has been functioning. So I, I know that a lot of us that, you know, this is Buddhism. So we have lists. In fact, here we have lists of lists, lists upon lists upon lists. And I know that many of us, myself included, you know, we often want very clear directions. We would love to know exactly how long I should sit. What is the optimal amount of time? Is 15 minutes too short? <laughs> if is 20 okay? Do I have to really like what is the exact amount of time? And what are the exact indicators that I'm in the first jhana? And what are the exact indicators that I'm a stream enterer? I know. <laughs> that we would all like these type of uh, exact clarifications. And what I'm getting at is that this, this sutra is not, is not gonna do that. 
what's happening is that we are being given this beautiful discourse, this beautiful lesson in the Bodhisattva path. And yes, each of these 10 of each of these 10 is, is a deep part of the practice, but there's a way in which I want you to kind of take a step back and like almost, you know, if you, especially if you've been coming or listening every night or, and, and all of that, a sutra like this washes over you. It even washes over me, like as the teacher of it, where there's like, there's so many ideas and, you know, the list upon the list that to try to like really hold on to any particular aspect, I actually feel like you miss what's happening here which is a much more beautiful kind of cascading of ideas. So that's sort of actually two different ways of saying the same thing, which is, which is that these are very unique lists. <laughs> They're lists that are sort of indicative and suggestive, right? Indicative in terms of they're literally telling you to do something, but suggestive as well, where it's more of a feeling and the reason why I just went through all of that to kind of give you a feel for the sutra and like what's happening is because of what's about to happen with this idea of pranidhana. <laughs> it's like, if you don't, it's why, you know, I always do this with, with my Dharma talks and, and, and it's been from the beginning, which is like, do I teach you the thing that they're about to say this isn't? Is it worth my time to tell you about all this, that they're just gonna take it away? But them removing it is, is part of the joy. And so if you don't know what's being taken away, it's sort of not as impactful. And so we're gonna to start tonight. Yes, start. That was all warm up preliminary. We're gonna to start tonight with a really serious explanation of this ninth Paramita of Pranidhana. I've spent a lot of today um, in the dictionaries. I've been spent a lot of today in our Pali English dictionary, and then to our hybrid uh, San, uh, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit dictionary, really trying to get a feeling, uh, a deeper feeling for the etymology of this word Pranidhana. It's, it's, I'm coming up short. I know what all the constituent parts of it, the pra, which means the original, the beginning, before. Ni is usually a negator. And then dana, D-H-A-N-A. -A. Not D long A, N A dana, which is the giving, the generosity, number one. This is pranidhana. Da -na. So it has the, the, huh, the H. And what's interesting right away, just right away in Sanskrit, da -na, with the, with the H is fortune, wealth. And it originally meant the prize. Like if you ran the race and you won, you got the dana, you got the prize, the wealth. And so it's interesting that with just the slightest shift of one letter, and it's a very similar letter too. So from a dana to a dana, or I should say from a dana, the wealth, to dana, the giving of a gift. So they're very related in there. And this word pranidana has something to do with wealth or at least the negation of wealth. Again, I cannot find a satisfactory etymological explanation of what this word means. So we, we now leave etymological origins and we get into what would be called hermeneutics, usage, the usage of words. So not necessarily what their roots constituents mean, but how they are used. And this is, so this is where we'll really get into our discussion of pranidhana. I mentioned at the top of, of the hour 
pranidhana is usually translated as devotion. Um, and why it's translated as devotion is interesting, but let's back it up. You know, this is why, by the way, this, you know, I study Chinese, not necessarily because I love the Chinese language, although I, I do really think it's a beautiful language, but I studied Chinese because I want to know about Buddhism. And so a lot of times, if you really want to understand Buddhism, even though the original language of it is a kind of poly hybrid Sanskrit or whatever, the Chinese when in reading these texts is very, very helpful often in understanding hermeneutics, meaning how words were being used. And so the Chinese, this, uh, this right here, yun, yun is, it's so clear, it's unequivocal. And when you start to then get it into the usage of pranidhana, Oh yeah, this is not devotion. The Chinese word yuan, that this is how they translate it. It's called the yuan paramita. Yuan means, well, you know, you can never really do that. You can never really say it just means this, but the sense of it is about will, willing something to be the case you could think of it as, well, so this is where it gets all really weird and interesting. It's where this all gets just really weird and interesting regarding language and ideas. So I'm going to back up and then we'll come back to where we are right now, but when we back up, I'm going to just tell you what it seems that pranidhana means. Again, this is about hermeneutics, about the usage of it, and the fact that the Chinese translated it the way they did. It seems very, very clear what this word means, and so therefore what this parimita is. Have I'm, I know, I know you've done this. I do it. I've done it. You do it. I know you've done it. Have you ever wanted something to be the case? And so you set your mind in a concentrated way to try to will that to be the case. If you have ever done that, and this can be regarding maybe a, maybe a health issue that came up and you put you focused your concentration and you willed, you really wanted something to be. And so you wanted to will it into existence or out of existence. That activity of concentrating one's intention, it includes your attention because you definitely need to focus your attention. But this is about intention. And so that process of focusing one's intention to will something to be, that is pranidhana. And it's exactly what the Chinese character means in terms of yuan. And it, if you go looking into what pranidhana means and its usage, they are referring to a concentration of intentional energy on something to be the case. So to will something to be. So that's what we're talking about. Now, how this becomes devotion, I, it's kind of right there. What's also, what's also right there is how this becomes prayer. So pranidhana also gets translated as prayer, vow, surrender, devotion. It gets translated all these different ways. And I think that that's interesting. I think it's interesting that all of these words are kind of in a matrix of ideas prayer, devotion, will, 
intention. And, you know, I put that all out there because, you know, I don't know. Um, the, it's, it's, it's just, it's something. Again, I, I said it from the beginning. It's probably something that you've done. That's something you do. It's something that all cre human beings seem to have done. And I guess something that uh, I suppose something that needs to be said and not exactly sure how to put this, but the reason why a, a possible reason why this gets wrapped up into, oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 I I retract, I retract all of my hesitation. <laughs> and so there's another idea that's very, very wrapped up in this. And the other idea that's wrapped up in this would be in Sanskrit, it would be called the Shraddha. Um, and Shraddha would, is another one in English, it's usually shraddha is usually translated as faith. So here we have faith, and here in pranidana we have prayer or devotion. Both of those are kind of wrong in a way, but I mean, it's not wrong, it's just tricky in English because of our uh, Judeo Christian background. And so these words like faith or these words like devotion, they conjure up certain. Uh, like devotion. Oh, you mean on my knees in church, bit praying to God? You mean that? No, actually. And so these English words, devotion and prayer get tricky. But what I was about to say is, is that a big aspect of pranidana is this idea of shraddha, usually translated as faith. But actually what shraddha means is certainty. It's the opposite of doubt. So, you know, doubt when you're like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, eh, eh, eh. So, you know, that mentality, it, forget the, um, forget the subject. It's about this mentality where it's like, well, I don't know. Then think about the mentality that knows. Again, it doesn't matter what. In fact, it's actually more interesting if you if you eject subject, if you get rid of subject and just look at the disposition of a mind that's like, ah, I mean, maybe I'll go this way, maybe I'll go that way, versus the mind that knows it's going this way. So there's certainty and there's doubt. That, I, I want you to put that on for a second and feel that, like feel how, you know, get a feeling for doubt. I know that you've probably had your moments of doubt. You know, it's just sort of like indecision and uncert uncertainty. And it's like, uh, uh. And I hope you've had a moment of certainty when you just know, you know, it's, it's either, you know, maybe it's directionality and you know the way we're, you know, we're going the right way. Don't look at the map. I know we're going the right way. So there's like that type of certainty or there's like a certainty that like, I don't know, often, I, I again, this is something that I hope that you've had the experience of, but like, you know, occasional moments that you feel like you're, you're in the right place at the right time. You're like certain, you're, it's like, wow, this is like, I'm supposed to be here right now. I'm certain of it. Again, versus a doubtful mind that's sort of like, should I be, should I be going here? Should I be doing this? I don't know. So I just want you to, again, put on those two dispositions, the one that's doubtful versus the one that's certain. This is in the family of certainty. And what I want you to sort of uh, maybe pick up on is that that certainty 
could be called faith, but that would probably be problematic, even though there's a way that they operate the same, that someone who has faith and someone who knows those two dispositions are sort of cousins in a way. And so I just want you to kind of like, I, all I actually want you to know is why and how these terms might have been translated as faith. I'm not trying to argue that they should be translated that way. I just want you to know that it makes some sense in that way. Questions about pranidana, <laughs> the paramita, meaning this paramita of focused will. You know, Michael, <laughs> what comes to my mind? Oh, God, you threw so many things <laughs> in five <laughs> minutes. I was like, oh, my God. Because, <laughs> you know, you start from, like, you, you kind of bring in manifestations, right? Manifesting things. And then, of course, what comes to my mind is ob the observer is to observe. Then comes to my mind a double split experiment, right? <laughs> when it's like, you know, if you particles and waves. So this comes to my mind. And then at the end, you end with knowing. And then Krishnamurti comes to my mind, which says freedom from the known. So I'm like, okay, we have to think about or discuss what knowing knowledge is. And of course, it's semantics, of course, of course, it's ling or language. But then, like, yeah, you know, but this is not a condition, again, condition learned knowing. It comes from beyond the mind it becomes from beyond the knee so anyway you you brought in quantum physics entanglement double split experiment and end with for me and my world krishna murti i was like oh man i know that i'm in the right place <laughs> so thank you <laughs> oh connie thank you so much and you brought you said all you brought all that i didn't do any of that you <laughs> Um, and by the way, on, on the note of uh, manifestation and all of that, I do potentially want to talk about that. But because of the time, let's start our list. Unless there's any other questions, comments, or ideas about pranidana in general, because we got to get those off the table to begin with. Everybody's okay with this? So I got to tell you one other thing, and it has to do with, it has to do with, um, no, I'm actually not going to do it because it, it, it's too late. It, it, it's just a little fun. It's just a little aside that's not actually as interesting as I originally thought. But what is as interesting as I originally thought is... <laughs> So pranidana, the the um, this idea of devotion. I I guess. So oh okay yeah I I had this to say about it before we go through the list of ten. And and I, yeah so this is where I want was going to talk about manifestation and all of that. So this idea of willing something to be the case. It's what we're going to be talking about tonight. It's that again, yes, it is sort of the, uh, the secret or manifestation in an aspect. But what I wanted to talk about was where it's where this is going with the list of 10 tonight. And the idea about this pranidana, um, this willpower even, you could call it willpower, but in English willpower means something different than we would, or that I would like it to mean, which is the power of will, like to will something into existence. Willpower is more about endurance. But that, that pranidana, to focus your attention and try to will something to being, it's, I wanted to mention that it's like, it's kind of like a, if you're familiar with this really classic uh, parable of the monkey's paw, right? And the parable of the monkey's paw is this cat, this warning, this caveat of be careful what you wish for. 
So it's a famous short story, if you don't know it, about, it's called the, the Monkey's Paw, and the Monkey's Paw is a, an actual severed monkey's hand that grants wishes. But the story is, if you, if, again, if you're not familiar with it, the story is, is that somebody gets a hold of this and, you know, I forget the exact circumstances of the story, but they like, they wish for a million dollars. And the next day they found out that they inherited a million dollars because their dad died. And so it's like, you get what you wished for, but at a cost. And that's sort of, and the, the, the tale of the monkey's paw is a bunch of people that wish for different things. And then it's about what they actually didn't see as a consequence of what they wished for. What I'm getting at is that I think that this kind of pranidhana, the willing, from a Buddhist point of view, this, uh, it works. <laughs> it's true. It and it has a lot to do with the nature of reality as being somewhat mind made to begin with and therefore the will or concentrated focus, attention and awareness can have a lot to do with that. And then also see Connie's comments about quantum physics and quantum entanglement and all of that. But the idea is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, you don't need to be you know, necessarily some super duper bodhisattva to do this. It's just that if you are not operating at a the, the no self empty type level of a bodhisattva, you might get yourself wrapped up in a monkey paw situation regarding what you're willing for. Meaning that if you're willing or your intention is coming from a very ego centered place, you might be able to manifest something, but without understanding the larger ramifications of what that will or what that manifestation uh, requires or something like that. So I just want to put that out there that, you know, that this is not necessarily this upper bodhisattva level practice. However, the reason I said all of that was to, you know, again, it's to, sh to, to speak about how this list that we're about to talk about is kind of funny. And what I mean is, is that, you know, um, so I, I guess maybe I should say, it. So this is the thing I was going to say that I didn't say, now I'm about to say it. So there's a place within the yoga world, the traditional Asamkhya uh, kind of Ashtanga yoga world of Patanjali, this Pranidhana thing comes up. And in fact, it comes up in a lot of yoga traditions, even yoga traditions that were alive and well at the time of the Buddha. And pranidhana does seem to mean this kind of devotion, a kind of surrendering to a higher power. And so within the uh, Samkhya yoga tradition that you may or may not be familiar with, there is something called Ishvara pranidhana. Ishvara means the Lord. And in many ways, it means sort of a God-like being, a higher being, a higher self in that sense. And so the Ishvara Pranidhana in the traditional yoga world is this sort of surrendering and, and in terms of intention, focused awareness and willpower that I've been describing, in the Asamkhya tradition, it's, it's seemingly more about focusing that devotion and will towards moksha, liberation, unification with Ishvara, a bunch of things like that. But it's definitely sort of wrapped up in a kind of willing yourself out of the um, little self and into the higher self. That's sort of the gist of pranidhana in the classical Asamka yoga tradition. And this is where I tell you that just to take that away. <laughs> because this is where Buddhism is, it's unique, it's different. And so for the bodhisattva, practicing the paramitas, when it comes to practicing this pranidhana, this willing, willpower, 
the Bodhisattva considers 10 dharmas as foremost. And all of these, like last week, all of these are written more or less in the same structure, which is that the Bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of pranidhana the knowledge of all dharmas and then this list of 10. So this is this will take a minute to kind of break down the way the language is working here. So for example, the first one is that in practicing this willpower, this pranidhana, the bodhisattva regards knowledge that all dharmas are birthless, unproduced. That's the first one. Now, the birthlessness of dharmas has come up. It has come up in previous nights of this sutra. It has certainly come up a lot in the dharma doors. Dharma doors, pranya paramita based Buddhism, we talk a lot about the birthlessness of all dharmas. I'm going to do my best, even though time is already flying by, I'm going to do my best to give you an understanding of birthlessness if you don't have a good understanding already. But before I give you this understanding of birthlessness, I want you to understand how the sutra is working. So the this sutra is working in an interesting way where it's saying that the bodhisattva practicing pranidhana what they will what they're manifesting not a mercedes not a condo in miami not a private jet they're not willing those things what the bodhisattva pranidhanas if i can turn it into a verb and do that what the bodhisattva pranidhanas is that they have knowledge that all dharmas are birthless. And, and the thing about it is, is that what I mean is, you, we have talked about this. We've danced around this idea. We have even had beautiful moments together where we've had flashes of, of insight regarding the birthlessness of all dharmas. What this, what tonight is saying is, is that the bodhisattvas, they're, they're like, can I please, can I please know that all dharmas are birthless? <laughs> and I, I laugh, but that's the humor I'm talking about. I want you to know that that's the image that you could, should kind of have in your mind. And it's kind of funny for the bodhisattva to be like down on their knees, like, May I please know that all dharmas are birthless? May I please know that they all have no signs? <laughs> okay, so I just want you to know that, that that's how it's working tonight. And it's fun, it's supposed to be funny in that way, where to like, to pranidhana, to will for this is kind of supposed to be funny, but it's supposed to speak to the you know, the really superlative nature of the bodhisattva in that way. Okay, is everybody okay? Doing okay? Cool. So, now that we know the general structure of this list of 10, that the bodhisattva is going to be down on their knees, <laughs> willing to have this knowledge. And the first bit of knowledge is that all dharmas are, oh, and you might have noticed too, I don't know if you noticed, but all of these begin with the same Chinese character, which is the Chinese character for its, uh, wu, it's uh, a low tone, wu, but what it means is a um, lacking, to, to be without. And so you might notice like the first two are birthless, signless, but then since cessationless gets a little list, like uh, a, a, a tongue twister. 
So we revert to being without cessation, without actual being. I'm going to go through these, so don't worry. But I just want you to know that all the whole list is the bodhisattva, pranidhanas, for knowledge of all dharmas lacking for to, to know, to know how it is that all dharmas lack. And the first one is arising or birth. So just so we're clear, a dharma in this case is anything you could possibly imagine or think of, no matter how big, no matter how small, if it's the Eiffel Tower, a uh, piece of lint, the color red, the feeling of my, my first love, anything that you could delineate off as a thing that is not another thing, <laughs> anything, that's a dharma. So we are talking about anything and everything in the known universe. Yes, the stars, the sun, the moon, light, everything and everything at, at what we're referring to as a little d, dharma, any given phenomena. And this is saying, this is the profound pranya paramita statement that all dharmas, the sun, <laughs> a piece of lint, whatever it is, all dharmas do not arise, are not birthed do not come into being. <clears throat> and there is, of course, sort of levels to this particular idea of the birthlessness of all phenomena, the birthlessness of all dharmas. There is sort of levels of sort of uh, even just understanding what we're talking about then there is a deeper level of actually knowing what we're talking about. And the deepest level is what is called the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas. So there are these varying levels to, to fully understand what we're about to talk about, this idea of the birthlessness of all things. So, for tonight, for the, the upaya tonight, the skillful means tonight is going to be the fist. It's the easiest one I have. It's always right here, but of course it's not here. And what, so when we talk about a fist, now a fist is definitely like the Eiffel Tower, like the sun and like a piece of lint where it's a and it's a phenomena it has a name and look it even has an appearance and has a form so the idea is is like look there's the fist regarding the birthlessness of this fist most things in this world conceptually, as we think of them, come from somewhere. A, uh, you know, I, I often talk about my, my little clock, and it even tells me that it was made in China, that, and I'm sure there was a factory there where it came off the assembly line, and it was, it was birthed. I mean, it's an inanimate object, so it was originated or created. And of course, if I got busy tearing this apart, it would, just, it would, be, it would come to nothing. But what this is saying is that the clock doesn't never, it never gets produced and it never goes away. Likewise, my fist. But the reason why I wanna use my fist tonight is because it's so easy to show you how it doesn't exist. Because the, phys the physical necessities of said fist are still right here, but there's no, there's no fist though. Oh, now there's a fist. What the birthlessness of all dharmas 
is saying is that all phenomena is like a fist, which is that it is a label that the mind can put on a form. Michael, very quick. Isn't it, <clears throat> what comes to my mind is um, the, the thing of like, when we say it, there is something, and um, hold on a second, and there is something, um, so couldn't we say it is a wrist and it is not a wrist? You're talking wrist? Oh, oh a fist, sorry, fist, okay. fist. Couldn't we say it is a fist and it's not a fist? Because as soon as we say it is not, we assume, you know what I'm saying? Like we, we fall back in duality. So let me, let me, uh, so here's the question regarding the birth or origin of phenomena of dharmas. Here's the question. Where did this fist come from? Or where did the fist go? Where in space and time did the fist go? If you're sitting there going, it didn't go anywhere. And if you realize that it didn't come from anywhere, that's the birthlessness. It doesn't come from anywhere. And the, the reason why I use the fist is because it's a very, very, very convenient example. But what's kind of very hard to, to like really grok in that deep grokking way is how this principle that it didn't come from anywhere and it doesn't go anywhere, how that principle is true of all phenomena. That's what's a little trickier because I know that we have ideas about where the sun came from and we have ideas about where we came from and we have ideas about where everything comes from. But what this prana wisdom, what this is saying and what Buddhism is saying, frankly, is that all phenomena, all dharmas don't come from anywhere and don't go anywhere. Just like the fist didn't actually come from anywhere. Now, if you're, if you're sitting there going, but it's coming from my mind because I'm labeling it, then yeah, okay, Bodhisattva, you're totally on the right path and keep going on the right path. That's, yes, that's where it comes from. But in terms of birth, natural, like physical coming into existence, a factory, a womb, some sort of origin, if you get that the fist didn't, it did, it's not that kind of a thing. It's not that kind of a thing that comes from anywhere. If you get that, the labeling, then it's called Nama Rupa. But if you get the labeling that's involved in this and that you're like, oh, fist is just a label that my mind can apply to a, a, what a, a thing that looks like something, but that doesn't make a thing that comes from anywhere and goes anywhere. And again, the deeper import of this is that this is the, this is, the, about the birthlessness of all phenomena. And I know that that's a lot harder to kind of fully grasp in that way, but that's what they're talking about is how all these words and ideas are actually labels for perceptions of form, not actual entities that exist in some way that can then be born and go away. Is everybody okay with that birthlessness? Of, everybody okay about the birthlessness of all phenomena? And well, how does causality plays into that context? By causality, do you mean? Uh, cause and effect? Um, 
No, yeah, that's the um um yeah, Connie, that as always asking the deep questions. Um there at the <laughs> As far as this list of dharmas go, as far as this list of ideas go that we're about to discuss, cause and effect is a, an illusion. There is no before and after. There is no cause making an effect. They arise simultaneously. Yeah. Just saying. Okay. Um, Okay, I, you know, by I, I want to remind us too, you know, that we're at Paraminta number nine. <laughs> so the, this is like pretty, you know, advanced ideas in that way. And so we're, 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 we're going to run into issues regarding language is what I'm getting at. <laughs> okay, let's talk about number two which is that the bodhisattva in the practice of pranidhana vows or wills to know that all dharmas are signless. This is called animita, no signs. And this is of course a fun one. I do this one a lot. We talk a lot about how these Okay, so signs. This is a this is a tricky one, of course. Um, by signs, we actually mean qualities or characteristics. We're referring to lakshana, also sometimes called nimitta. Um, these essential qualities or characteristics. We're talking about things like color, shape, size, sound quality. Is it sweet smelling? Is it is it putrid smelling? Is it sweet tasting? These are all going to be qualities and characteristics. And of course, the the idea this is just general uh, metaphysics, just general philosophy. How we know what something is is based on its characteristics and qualities. If it's a if it's a kind of spherical, red, sweet, crunchy piece of food, it might be an apple. Because that's those are the characteristics and qualities of an apple: spherical, fruit, red, or green. The idea is, is that there's this really intimate relationship between what something is and its characteristics and qualities. In fact, you could say that what something is, is the totality of its characteristics and qualities. Th this is a, this teaching of signlessness is a very deep teaching because what it's suggesting is, is that these characteristics and qualities, like for example, I have another round red object here in my hand you would be inclined to think that this is red and that red, the redness, is a characteristic or a quality, a lakshana, that is possessed or held in some way by this. And it's what makes it it. I've got a yellow shirt on and this is a red uh, round object. So the shirt's one thing and that's another thing. And I can do, I can tell that based on their different qualities or characteristics. But as I walk us through often in the Dharma doors, I walk us through this interesting, um, you know, it's just an interesting reality of colorblindness, which is that based on different people's eyes and the actual physical makeup of their eye, things appear different colors. And you could actually imagine somebody that has a different set of rods and cones in their eyes where this object appears green to them. But to you, it might appear red. And if, you, if you're aware of that, that 
other people have other experiences, right? If you're aware of a phenomena like colorblindness, and you can, and if you think about that just a little bit, you don't have to think about it very deeply, but if you think about it, you might realize, oh, the redness or the greenness for this other person, the color, it arises dependent upon the eye. And depending on my eye, it appears red, but depending on his eye, it appears green. So the redness or the greenness cannot be said to be a quality or characteristic possessed or held exclusively by the object. It's just patently not true. We know it. The color phenomena, the characteristic of color arises in the in-between based on your unique set of rods and cones and based on the unique kind of, mm, this gets tricky, but let's just call it form or physical structure of the object. But the point remains the same, which is that when you're seeing a red object, that redness is not over here. It's kind of arising in the in-between. If you understand that, which of course I go, I practically go through that every Sunday night. But if you understand that about how that quality of red or green, it's not actually possessed or held by the thing I think it is. It's part of sort of the, uh, a kind of perceptual illusion or delusion that the red is over there. But the reality is, is that it's sort of arising in the in-between. And if you understand that, then just on the level of color, you understand how all objects actually don't have any color. All color is actually arising in an in-between state based on your eyes. The point of this is that color is a sign, meaning a lakshana, a characteristic or quality, and ultimately, even the roundness will be a characteristic or a quality that's arising in the in-between. That's not actually held by this. You perceive it as round. It may or may not be round. And more importantly, there might be somebody else that doesn't see it as round or spherical in that sense. These this is where it gets tricky and, I, and you know, I've done it on other nights. I can't do it tonight. But all characteristics and qualities, whether it's the sound, the smell, the size, the shape, the color, the number, everything, all characteristics and qualities are ultimately not held, owned, or possessed by the objects that we think own, hold, and possess them. All characteristics and qualities actually arise in an in-between uh, dependently origination, a dependently originated state. And that's how all dharmas are signless at the end of the kalpa or at the end of the day. And, and it's, it's about understanding how perception works. This is not it's actually not much more than that. It's why I, I start with the colorblindness example and try to work our way forward because it's actually just talking about how perception, it's not just beauty that's in the eye of the beholder. It's all in the eye of the beholder is the idea. Questions about signlessness. So now all these things, all these dharmas, clocks and apples and the sun and pieces of lint, now we know that any and all given phenomena do not arise just like the fist. It, it is, it be but it doesn't go anywhere and doesn't come from anywhere. The signs, the characteristics of the fist 
You might think that they're over here, but they're actually arising in the in-between. Number three, the Bodhisattva practicing pranidhana, vows or wills for knowledge of how all dharmas are without cessation. I've actually already told you this one. It's the opposite of arising. It's the ceasing. And so the idea is, is that we tend to think that things come from somewhere and go somewhere. So they arise and they cease. Number three here is saying all dharmas are without cessation. They don't go anywhere. And that's just like my fist. Did, did the fist get destroyed? Did it get totally annihilated? Is it utterly obliterated from reality? Is it totally ceased out? No, because the fist does not have the nature of something that can be destroyed. It's a concept in your mind. So there, it doesn't come from anywhere. It has no characteristics or qualities of its own and it doesn't go anywhere. Number four, and the Bodhisattva practicing pranidhana vows, wishes, or wills for knowledge that all dharmas are without anything to be there. The, the Chinese uh, grammatically is very interesting. It actually says that the Bodhisattva vows or wishes for knowledge that all dharmas are without anything to be there. And that's also like a fist, which is interesting, of course, because I know that you are like, but it's right there. It's right there. But the idea is, is that if you understand what I've been trying to articulate regarding the fist, not coming from anywhere, having no signs and not going from anywhere, then this idea that there actually isn't any fist there should be, it should be very clear, right? Be okay with there not being any fist there? If, if, if you're actually very, if you're totally cool with there not being any fist there, then the next one, number five, there's nothing there to grasp. That is what the bodhisattva pranidhanas or vows for knowledge that all dharmas are ungraspable. There's nothing there to be grasped. Like I just said, if you're, if you're totally down with how it is that there's no fist there to begin with, then the ungraspability of it is, is should be obvious because we just established that it, there's nothing there to begin with, right? So all of these go very, very well together in that way. But I need, even though it's getting late, I need to stop on this one for a second. So the Bodhisattva practicing pranidhana, vows or wishes for knowledge, that all dharmas are ungraspable, that there's nothing there to grasp. The important part about this is that remember, we, we never stray very far from the Four Noble Truths, the original teachings of the Buddha. Even though this gets a little kind of wild, I know it gets wild, we never stray very far from the original Dharma. And so what I mean is, and actually this is, yeah, this is a really nice way of articulating this bodhisattva path. If you really are kind of with me on the birthlessness and also no cessation, no characteristics or qualities, and actually no being there. And therefore, since there's nothing there, with no characteristics or qualities, having not come from anywhere and not going anywhere, if you understand that it's ungraspable, 
The idea is, is that factors right into the Four Noble Truths in this idea that then all phenomena are ultimately undesirable. And I don't mean that in a way that like, that they shouldn't be desired. This isn't a, a value judgment. It's not a moral judgment. It's actually a, a, a philosophical dharmic statement that all these dharmas are, you can't desire them. I know you, you, you do, and that's the ignorance and that causes the samskara, the samsara and the suffering. I know that. But the funny thing about it is this realization of, oh, even though I'm trying to get it, grasp it, there's nothing there to grasp. So this is futile. And that's where the bodhisattva out of wisdom comes to cessation. They don't necessarily need to like, must not want, must not want. It's the realization, there's nothing there to want. <laughs> it's, it's why I'm totally into the bodhisattva path in that way that it doesn't require this arduous, like self-flagellating, like um, uh, that relinquishment in that way. It's about wisdom. And then, if, about, and, and then about not being foolish. Yeah, Connie. But if we can't, we could even go one step further in the sense of like, because it's really hard to um, grasp, but there's nothing really to grasp. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing solid and everything is fluent. And, you know, I, you know, the, the biggest suffering starts when, you know, when we are born and we get, uh, we, we learn that um, there is an eye to grasp, right? There is this I mean, this is the source of everything. If we would really like embody and really understand deeply that there is no eye to grasp and then automatically there is nothing to grasp, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely Connie. I mean, you're, you're cutting right to it. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it really, all of this begins with the perception that there's something out there to begin with. Last question that I have, and maybe not, but <laughs> why do you think, like you personally question, why do you think, um, and it's maybe a little bit out there, that the human brain is made in a sense that, you know, all, people on this planet think generally this way or struggle with it. I'm just wondering from a very, phys let's, let's go down to a physical like physical reality, right? Even there, there's not and everything is mine, blah, blah. But on a physical level, we can't deny there's a human experience. We can't deny, I, we have feelings, blah, blah, blah. This is coming up. So I'm wondering why is our brain wired that way? Why, like from a physical point of view, is this just our evolution? Because we've learned that over a thousand and thousand years and we end up where we are. Or why do you think, for me, it's the question is there is a reason why we experience how we experience. There's a reason why there's the suffering. Okay, then we, so we understand there is. So there is no suffering. So what is your POV when it comes to that that we all have this experience it's not like that norm is like yeah well you have it i don't have it you know like everybody even you know so if you are not enlightened and even though enlightened beings i feel they have this conditioning nevertheless they just cut, cut through it and understand it so anyway i would love to hear your opinion about that so i yeah, wow. Um, I had a thought I'm, and I'm, I'm working through it to see if it makes sense. I think it makes sense. It's the first thing that came to mind when, when you started. So I, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing about how the question is being asked, Connie. And so 
I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out uh, how to articulate this, but you, you, you could ask a similar, you could ask a similar question, which is why do all birds fly? But that's an interesting way of thinking about it because you could then realize, oh, no, no, no. It's that we call all things that fly birds or at least fly with wings and yada, yada, yada. But my point is to ask why do birds fly might not be the right way to ask the question. In other words, why do all humans think this way? Maybe it's that if you're thinking this way, that's what it means to be a human. Oh, yeah. Kind of, an, I mean, this is just yeah. a raw idea that you- Yeah, yeah, I have to you know. see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you give me something to think about. Already. It's it's a very karmic kind of way of thinking about it, which we, by which I mean is like, the reason why you think you're a human Connie like I do is because we have the karma to think that we're a human. Mm -hmm. Like, and so there it appears that way. It's sort of like a little feedback loop in a way. Yeah. But, okay. I mean, yeah, like, cool. No, no I, will, I will think about it. I wrote it down. So thank you. I will. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, Mike, yeah. I have a question about the word grasping. Mm. It, in English, probably has many other meanings as well, but two main meanings that come to mind to grasp something, to, you know, literally grasp it. Yep. But also to grasp an idea. Interesting. Is to, is what, is to understand it, is to get it, is to have it. And I'm just sort of wondering out loud, I wasn't going to ask it, but uh, how does that relate to how do you, I, I'm thinking about how it relates to the idea that we, you know, create the fist by carving it out of the, you know, we create it in our mind, right? And, and so how, how, I, I mean, I know it's, I don't want to get too hung up on language because in other languages, you don't necessarily say grasp an idea, but we do in English, right? So wondering what you think about that that you're cre they're creating something by grasping it In you know? indeed and you know it's it's an interesting point about the in english that dual use of grasping i actually think it 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 gets really interesting because the this term and this word or this idea of grasping it's an interesting one. And as Buddhism develops, they, they get more interested in grasping as an activity, like as an actual ac activity of the mind or body or what have you. And if you're familiar, if anybody is familiar with uh, Yogacara Buddhism, so-called mind-only Buddhism, or Vijnanavada, the, the consciousness-only school of Buddhism, they are all about this idea of grasping. In particular, Noam, almost the dual use of it, meaning physically and mentally, because it's the mind-only school, there actually isn't any physical grasping. It's all mental, which is why this comes to mind and is interesting. But a big thing about the mind-only school is they speak a lot about the grasper and the grasped mm -hmm. and how the grasper and the grasped co-arise with each other although the grasper thinks that they were there before the grasped. <laughs> that, uh, so in other words, like for the mind only school, there's a one very critical verb that we do and it's grasping and that will hold an idea in place for your whole life in a way, yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, did I? Oh no, because Connie asked a question. So I just wanted to finish. I, ha I was I was on a thought regarding grasping, regarding Dharma, about how we never stray too far from the original teachings. And so what I wanted to get at was that idea of, oh, I, I did, which is that the Bodhisattva doesn't need to withhold their grasping. They know there's nothing there to grasp. And so it's a very, it's a subtle shift, but kind of a big one in the Mahayana tradition where, and this all has to do with the emptiness stuff, by the way, even though that's not coming up tonight, this is all predicated on this idea of emptiness. It's what we mean when I say the fist has no characteristics, it ultimately isn't there. It's empty is the idea. And so Mahayana Buddhism is very based on this emptiness because it, it, it deals with the grasping in the, in the way that I've been talking about, where you don't have to withhold your grasping, you realize there's nothing there to grasp to begin with. Likewise, I'm gonna just do number six and number seven together. The Bodhisattva practicing pranidhana, vows or wishes or wills for a knowledge about how all dharmas neither come nor go. So this is sort of like birth and death or creation cessation, but this is more about the coming and going and also goes with the fist in terms of where did the fist go? Where did it go? And that, that's like a really interesting thing to ask yourself. Where did it go? Like, where is it right now? Right. And if you realize, oh, it's nowhere right now. <laughs> and guess what? It's nowhere right now. So that's no coming, no going. Number eight, then, is this really deep idea, which is that it's the Bodhisattva vows or wishes for knowledge about how all dharmas are ultimate without any svabhava, any self nature independent self-existing nature that's what this one is it shouldn't come as any surprise from everything that has come before this that the fist has no inherent self nature and you know i can show you how it has no inherent self nature right which is this idea of okay <laughs> What was the essential part of the fist that is no longer here? What's the essential part? And if you realize, oh, there is no essential part. The fist, again, is just a concept. It's just an idea. It has no independent self-existing self-nature or svabhava. Number nine, all dharmas, knowledge that all dharmas, and the way that it reads in the original Chinese are that all dharmas are without before, during, after, or any equivocation, any equivalence. And it ultimately is referring to the all dharmas being outside of time they have no temporality. In other words, you would, you would want to say that there was before the fist. This is, this is during the fist. And then there's after the fist. But if you understood everything up to this point and realize there's not, no fist, nothing to grasp, no self nature, then the idea is, is that we have completely removed the existent that which was ex existence. So there's no, there's nothing to be before. There's nothing to be now and nothing afterwards. No temporality. And number 10, the Bodhisattva practicing pranidhana vows, wishes, is devoted to knowledge 
of the undifferentiation, basically, of all dharmas, that all dharmas are undifferentiatable, are without di distinction, uh, without being differentiated. And this is kind of like having a self nature, but the idea is, is that if we didn't, if, you know, self nature is like an essence, like this, like, essence. So what if I was willing to let go of the idea of an es es essential fist? The tenth one is this idea that all dharmas are, are, or knowledge about how all dharmas are ultimately undifferentiatable, meaning you cannot extract the fist from the idea of hand, fingers, fingernails, all of these other ideas. It cannot, any dharma, I'm just using the fist tonight, but any idea, it cannot exist on its own, even conceptually as a differentiated object. Every dharma will ultimately be bound up conceptually in some other dharma and though it's true of all ideas or concepts, that they're all bound up in this, um, well, it's called the Dharma Datu. The example that I've given in the past is using like the alphabet. And yes, we have these distinct letters of the alphabet, but any one letter actually only makes sense as that letter because it's part of the framework of all the other letters. And I know that you can isolate your mind and just see that one letter, but you'll still, if it's the letter S, it's part of that whole matrix. Well, this fist is part of the whole matrix of the universe. It's a letter in the alphabet of the universe. And it is inextricable from all that other stuff because of the Dharma Datu and that interrelatedness of everything. That's it. Those are the 10 foremost observations of the Bodhisattva practicing Pranidhana. Right? That's it. Uh, stay tuned till next week <laughs> when we discuss the 10th and final paramita, jnana, knowledge. Yeah, if you, yeah, we, we haven't got the knowledge yet, right? Um, but one more to go. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, that's it for me. I, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take the silence as, as just like, you know, like soaking it all in. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Michael. And Connie, I love you. Thank you so much. Your questions all the time bring so much like texture.